I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Michael, the Chief Research Officer, guides the practice's research agenda and architecture by leveraging his extensive experience to identify and unlock emerging trends. Anurag, Vice President, helps clients on their workforce and location strategies, cutting across sourcing models, talent models, and functions. Rishi is a practice director in Everest Group's global sourcing and locations optimization team and co-leads Everest Group's Market Vista membership offering. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Michael. Take it away, Michael. Yeah, I just realized I was muted. All right, thank you, Trudy. Um, hey, so we were look just look, yesterday. I was looking at the 2020 key issues, the the things we were concerned about coming into the year, and uh, I was looking at the the things that the theme for the uh, the analysis was, was uncertainty, and this would have been right at the end of last year. And nowhere in there, in that list of, of things we were worried about, was the issue of a global pandemic. And so as we hit uh, the end of the Q, uh, first quarter. Uh, we were all thrust into a very new world, uh, something that we had not planned on uh, just a few a few months ago uh, at that time. So uh, what happens, we automatically got into, or we, we, we forced ourselves into a work from home model. Um, and uh, as, as a whole, I would say it actually worked pretty well. I'm glad it was 2020 where we had uh, readily available uh, conferencing, we had readily available internet, People had home offices uh, in, in, in pretty big numbers, uh, but we were able to successfully uh, make that transition uh, with a few hiccups. But as we started to talk to clients and as we moved into Q2 and started to think about Q3, um, the conversations about work from home have evolved. And so they are now starting to think about uh, work from home as, a, as an important issue, but it's more uh, morphed into a conversation around uh, the future of work. And so as we start to think about the future of work here, and as you see on the slide, it's really thinking about in the context of the worker or the workplace and work ways, uh, that e e evolves into a much broader conversation uh, around talent, around sourcing models, technology, governance, and how you're going to run the, run the business, locations, work from home. All those things come together to, uh, you know, what we've been referring to as everything is on the table. And so as clients and, and, uh, and, and folks like yourselves start to think about what they need to do, this, the, the work from home was actually the catalyst. The global pandemic was the catalyst for work from home. And then the, that became the catalyst for looking at many, many different uh, portions of the overall service delivery model. And so with that, I wanted to um, set the context for what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we're going to mostly be focused in on the sourcing model, the operating model, and the locations aspects of this, a little bit of the work from uh, work from home things. Um, the discussion points for today, are that we're going to give you some uh, first reactions from the data, and then we're going to talk about those uh, uh, future of delivery and location strategies, and we'll get some to some question and answer. So let's start with a quick poll. Uh, I want to hear from you guys what you're thinking about um, the components of the work that you see changing the most going forward here. And so uh, we'll launch the quick poll here for you. And so just check one of these here that you think is uh, the thing that you expect, or you can actually check multiples, but check the ones that are going to change the most. Okay, and they're starting to see the answers here. And we have a very large contingent focused in on one of the elements. Okay, great. You guys are fast voters. We already got over half the audience in the first 20 seconds. All right, let's go ahead and close it. Uh, and what you're going to see is a very big skew here uh, toward the working model. The working model is the work from home, but also looking at the location strategy. It was it was uh, was had had a uh, a big, big portion of the answers as well. So the talent models is there. Um, I do think I didn't get as many mentions here. The organizational governance. I do think that's going to be uh, coming to come into play here too um, as we get further into the uh, into the time sequence here. Um, but anyway, let's let's give this as a good context for the rest of the data. And so what I'm going to do here is turn this over to Anurag or Harishi, and he's going to take the uh, the first uh, first set of it, uh, reactions. 
thanks, Michael. Uh, so uh, as we as we move to uh, so what we have done here is we have looked at a number of parameters that we track as part of our quarterly analysis and have identified some of the interesting trends for you. So starting with what have been the trends in the outsourcing market? How did the outsourcing market responded to the pandemic? Uh, on this page, we have some of the key movements, key trends that we have seen. On the left hand side in orange, what you have are things which have witnessed a change. On the right hand side in blue, we have things which have largely remained similar. And when I say outsourcing, it refers to build signed by enterprises with a third party service provider. So coming to the notable changes, uh, first and foremost, the number of outsourcing transactions have declined in Q2 2020 if we compare with the 2018 or 2019. Having said that, the decline has not been as significant as one would expect. It's still just a 10% decline. Next, we see, so in 2019, we saw that IT outsourcing deals as part of the, as a, as a share of the overall transactions was going down. However, 2020, we saw a resurgence in IT, uh, especially in the uh, Q2 2020. And this is driven by the increasing focus on IT transformation, on digitalization. The third noticeable change we have, uh, and which, which, is, which hits the most, is that the share of gas size deals more than 200 million, they have declined significantly. And we have more data on this as we move down. So, but before that, let's look at some of the things which have remained constant. So first, the share of industry verticals. Uh, it largely remains the same. BFSI continues to dominate. Sub movement as we see an uptick in technology and communications, as well as from the government sector. Second, the share of buyer geographies remains the same. North America continues to get followed by Europe. And third, in terms of the deal tenure, it has remained more or less the same with short to medium term deals. Yes, then five years have uh, still continue to account for majority of the activity. Uh, with that, we move deeper into the data. So on page eight, so what we have on this page on the chart, the 100% it denotes the total number of outsourcing transactions. And these are transactions which are publicly announced. Uh, and as you would see, there is a decline from the quarterly average for 2018-19. So that's one of the trend. The other thing in terms of, uh, and it's driven by multiple factors, uh, be it recessionary sentiment, uh, which were prevalent even before the pandemic. So towards the end of 2019, we started seeing the recessionary sentiment. Overall global business slowdown, and also a greater focus on insourcing and strengthening of the GBS model. Uh, the other interesting thing, so what we have uh, on the chart is the split of the total number of outsourcing deals by IT outsourcing, BP outsourcing and multifunctions, which have both IT as well as BP. And as you would see, after the decline in 2019, the share of IT outsourcing has grown again. Uh, this is driven by, uh, this is primarily driven by enterprises' willingness to drive digital adoption, optimization, huge digital transformation push, uh, especially with the onset of the pandemic. And also enterprises are looking to capitalize on the uh, capabilities of service provider in terms of quick technology implementation. Uh, moving on, uh, what we have on this page is how the total, how the outsourcing deals, uh, what has been the shared in terms of the deal size. And as, as you would see, the large scale deals basically more than 200 uh, million, they have practically gone off the charts. So this reflects the overall conservative approach across organizations, uh, anticipation of a revenue cliff, floor decision making and budget freeze. And hence there is a risk averse stance here. However, what remains interesting to watch out for is as the disruption due to pandemic decline, uh, will we see a upsurge or an uptick in large size deals going forward? 
moving on so next what we have uh, is how what has been the trend in terms of center setup activity and i would request my colleague anurag to walk us through some of these trends thanks rishi uh, so on page 11 uh, we take a look at what have been the trends in new center setup activity uh, when we say new center this is all new delivery centers set up uh, so this includes all the third party centers as well as the gbs or in house or any jv hybrid kind of setups uh, and the thing to also keep in mind is this is we are talking about net new addition to capacity this is not inclusive of data on expansion of centers right uh, so like like we presented the earlier section, we're talking about the, the things that changed the most and also the things that stayed the same. If you look at the things that changed, um, uh, contrary to the deals, the outsourcing deals, where there was less than 10% dip, uh, on the number of new center setups, there has been a more than 60% decline, which in many ways is relatable given you know, all of us at some stage uh, were locked down. So there were shelter in place requirements, restrictions in movement led to, uh, you know, inability to conduct logistics and due diligence. And so there was a massive decline in number of new center setups. Um, along with that, um, while uh, the share of GBS or GIC or in-house uh, in those number of setups increased, there was a total decline in absolute number of uh, cents. Uh, there was a decline in number of GBS setups as well, right? Uh, however, uh, we believe that there is probably a you know, more commitment or the center setups on the GBS side were further downstream in their life cycle so that, uh, you know, they still got set up in this, in this period. Uh, the third point here is that uh, the engineering and R&D centers, uh, the share of those kind of centers grew significantly. Uh, while they have, uh, you know, they have dominated the landscape of new center setups for a, for a few years now, uh, there was a, you know, unprecedented step up or surge in uh, in the share, leading to more than 60% of new cent GBS setups being engineering oriented. Uh, part of this reason, as per our uh, analysis, is also that uh, in this period we saw a decrease in demand for traditional IT and business process services, given overall economic slowdown. The things that stayed the same uh, over the period, uh, one, I think the the number, the share of different geographies in terms of attracting new center setups stayed the same, uh, although uh, there was a consistent decline across all geographies. And secondly, uh, like in past years, the offshore nearshore locations continue to dominate. Uh, they still say, stayed strong. Um, uh, we ha will have to see, uh, watch this trend a bit more uh, uh you know as we go forward as to how this this mix changes but the next few pages have a little more detail on some of these trends let's move to page 12 yeah um uh, if you look at the if you look at the split of um uh, the centers as well as the total number of delivery center setups you can see that there was a massive decline from 113 centers last quarter sorry q1 2020 to 47 centers set up in q2 uh so that is the first message uh, as we said earlier, the decline driven by largely by travel restrictions, uh, as well as uh, a general slowdown in decision making, budget freezes in anticipation of demand cliffs, etc. At the same time, we saw that um, you know there was a, a overall share of GBS and GIC in the overall number of setups in, uh, it increased. Uh, partly because we see uh, even before COVID-19, there was a trend towards insourcing. Uh, but also during the crisis, we saw that there was more, much more reliance and resilience in the GBS side of the market. Uh, it, 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 it varied by market to market and company to company, but overall, at, as, a, as an aggregate, there was higher resilience in the GBS model. Interesting to see will be whether activity regains momentum in H2, uh, as several countries, especially in Europe, uh, lift lockdowns uh, and ease travel restrictions, especially also in India and Philippines kind of markets. Uh, so that will be an interesting time to watch. Um, the other is that uh, if you look at the GBS, uh, you know, massive increase in share of GBS to 85% of new centers, part of that we believe is also driven by GBS centers driving digital uh, transformation of the enterprise, which becomes all the more important given in, in this scenario. And so we took a deeper look at 
that angle as well as to what is the digital orientation of some of these center setup. So I'll ask my colleague Rishi to now take you through uh, what is our an analysis on the digital orientation of the market. Thanks, Anurag. Uh, so as, as we move, so the next couple of pages, we have what has been the trend around digital services, which services have been growing. So moving to page 14, uh, what we have on the left hand side is of the total GBS center set of what has been the share for traditional services versus digital services. And as you would see, there have been a significant uh, uptick in the demand for digital services. So it has moved up from 50% to around 70%. Mm -hmm. On the right hand side, we have a similar representation for the outsourcing market, the number of outsourcing deals. So digital has been dominating this market for quite some time now, and the trend continues. Uh, however, there is a use marginal decline. There's some decline over here, but we believe that's more cyclical in nature and not a sacrosanct trend which will continue. Uh, on the next page, we move deeper into some of the digital services which were in demand across both this segment, both these models. So what you have here is what has been the percentage component of each of these digital services for the total center setup or number of deals in H1 2020. And the arrows represent how these have changed with regard to 2019. So moving to the GBS first, advanced automation analytics, uh, they have been dominating the market, dominating the GBS market for some time and it continues to do so. Uh, some decline in demand for uh, advanced automation from GBS and this has to be driven by their growing maturity over there and hence some shift towards the outsourcing model now, some shift in demand for advanced automation towards outsourcing. Uh, on the outsourcing side, cloud continues to dominate given it's most mature with service providers having significant, with significant capabilities. And it's interesting to note that practically GBS have very limited share on the cloud. So their most enterprises are actually dependent on cloud, uh, for, uh, on dependent on the outsourcing model for cloud services. You would also see there is a significant component of digital others here, and this include segments such as mobility, cybersecurity, and we have seen a growth in demand for these services from the outsourcing model as well. So as we move on, so with that, we'll move on to the next section. Thank you, Rishi. Uh, All right, so we're going, we're going to take you through uh, our uh, our views on where this is going. So we've showed you a lot of data. Uh, let's talk about where it's going. And the way we do this is in, in, in three basic uh, groupings. So we'll talk about convictions, we'll talk about provocations and controversies. The convictions are our foundational beliefs. Those are things we, 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 we hold uh, true. Um, the provocations, we'll, we'll take one of those in each of the sections. Uh, and those are things that we think are interesting things to, 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 to discover, to uh, look at as value creation opportunities. And at the very end, we're gonna bring in the three controversies. Uh, and those will be something that we're considering for future uh, evaluation, future research, uh, as we move forward. So Anurag, let's take the first conviction and go from there. Thanks, Michael. Um, so on the first conviction, what we are seeing is that enter enterprises across the board, especially the large ones, are massively redesigning their services, delivery and locations portfolios. Uh, if, you look, if you look at what we have on the next page, we laid out some of the reasons uh, and the forces that are driving a re-evaluation almost. Uh, or a, almost a building from scratch. Uh, while some of these pressures, such as cost pressures, and you look at the right-hand bottom, the green one, the greater demand for complex skills were all already there in the past two, three years. Some of these have become more important. So look at the BCP resilience, lower risk exposure. This has become more important given the kind of disruption that was faced by the industry. But then also uh, some of the rising unemployment, protectionist sentiments getting stronger uh, are, a, are a result of the crisis, as well as higher adoption of flexible models are actually pushing companies to have to reinvent. So it's almost a, their hands are being forced in this, um, this re-evaluation and redesign of their service delivery portfolio. Um, if you move forward, we have uh, we have the provocation uh, in this same regard. Uh, so what we see is that 
uh, I'll, I'll cover the the sub the bullets first. So we see that companies are diversifying across offshore, nearshore, onshore markets. Now this may seem a bit confusing, but at a at a company level, at an enterprise level, this is based on what are the gaps, what are the priorities and objectives for each company, and based on that, contextualizing your strategy and and filling the gaps, right? So at an overall level, we have some analysis on how markets will grow. But at an eight individual company level, if you go back to the last slide, please, um, this will be more contextualized for each company. Now, at the same time, we see that there will be a focus on de-densifying the portfolio, just given companies want to achieve more BCP. In some cases, de-densifying helps achieve cost objectives. So we'll see more on that, um, that you know, companies are looking at more countries, remote models, et cetera. So we'll see more later. Uh, and the third point is that uh, because of all this, uh, companies will have to be, be very intentional about design shoring. Uh, so not really saying we should be uh, mostly offshore, we should be uh, you know near shore or onshore, but we are saying it has to be uh, tightly driven by design, which will enable companies to be flexible, iterative, but also intentional. Now, a summary of all of this is that um, uh, I'll have what she's having, which, which are the words of the innocent restaurant goer in when Harry met Sally is not the right recipe for you. Uh, where you know Companies will have to actually contextualize their strategies based on all the objectives and priorities that they have to walk, walk with. Um, over to Rishi to walk us through some of our um, you know, um, support pages for the provocations, please. Thanks, Anurag. So what we have on the next few pages is so is survey data from our recent surveys in July, August. Uh, so starting with the first one, one of the trend which is very prominent from the data is that offshoring does not show any signs of slowing down. And it is evident across most services, be it IT or business processes. Uh, there can be, there is some minor, uh, minor differences, but uh, essentially across most services you would see that the trend has been towards increase in offshoring, which is represented by the blue bars here. Uh, the only functional area where we see the response is more mixed or new drug is contact center. And this is pretty obvious uh, given during the crisis, a lot of offshore based contact centers went down and were not able to continue services, uh, which resulted in some companies bringing back work onshore. Does we believe that this trend might continue for some time now? Yeah. So Rishi, we saw this when you know when you looked in the data combined with some other charts we're we're going to show. What we, what this really was is that call center uh, or contact center uh, suffered a little bit of a challenge in some geographies, um, and and we'll show it in a couple of slides. But the Philippines was really what we're talking about there. So uh, companies are are still incrementally moving work to the Philippines, but there were also some companies that were moving it completely away from there. So they're bringing it back on shore just because they needed to have a, a de-risk their overall uh, service delivery model. So again, this one's more bi-directional, whereas all the rest of them are clear movements to more offshoring. And uh, I think, you know, you can almost go back to think about, you know, the work from home automatically enabled companies to think about, uh, we can do this anywhere, uh, we can do the work anywhere, including uh, low cost locations. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so as we move on, so while most enterprises are bullish on offshoring, uh, this does not mean that all work will move offshore. And as Michael also pointed, there is a bi-directional moment. Uh, there are multiple factors which will limit the growth in offshore penetration and risk being the most prominent one, be it political or service delivery risk. Further, uh, Many enterprises have already built significant offshore capabilities. And as they look to balance this, they release their portfolio, they will be building capabilities in some of the onshore near shore locations now. Uh, also, uh, some enterprises, they, uh, they are struggling to find right skill sets in offshore locations, especially for some of the next generation services, which will also drive, us, uh, drive some flow of work towards onshore location. And we go deeper into the locations question on the next page. So let me spend a minute on explaining what we have here. So we reached out to uh, to our clients on 
where do they see work moving to or moving out of? And the green bars represent locations where work is expected to move to, and red bars represent where work is expected to move out of from that location. So uh, coming to some of the key trends to note here, uh, overall, we would see that there's a lot of green here, which means that the global services delivery model will continue to grow. There is uh, increasing confidence on that. Uh, moving to some of the specific geographies, India's leadership position uh, as the go-to low-cost location uh, continues to grow, and it is also driven by the presence of a mature talent proposition here. Uh, further, we see some migration of work from high-cost locations in Western Europe to low-cost Eastern European cities. Also, if you it's interesting to note that Latin America, Africa, these are also expected to grow, and we believe this is driven by the increasing need for uh, diversity. Uh, Latin America, for the past few quarters, haven't seen any uh, significant momentum. We believe as enterprises in North America start to, to build their BCP model, they would uh, increasingly leverage Latin America for that. It's also interesting to note that when there is a significant move in this uh, offshore nearshore locations, the movement is not unidirectional, it's a bidirectional movement. So you would see growth in US and Canada, and we believe this will be on the back of contact centers that we spoke about, contact centers moving back from the Philippines in some cases, and also the, uh, also the willingness and demand to tap into these locations for next year skills. Uh, According to Philippines, you see the growth, but there is some growth, but there is some uh, decline expected as well, both in India and Philippines. So, so we believe that uh, there are multiple conflicting priorities that each enterprises will have uh, balancing across cost, risk, and the need for access to talent. And net-net, it will not be a movement into a single geography. We'll see growth across all locations or a rise in an omni shoring model. Uh, moving or beyond the locations, so further we also looked at what are the other key noticeable trends on the location service delivery models that are expected in future. And the key theme that emerges is that there's a strong focus on, on reducing the location's portfolio density and with, in that regard, organizations are planning to implement multiple changes, uh, be it greater share of remote delivery, uh, which, which is the most prominent one. However, there are other, other changes expected as well. So emphasis on geographic diversity, uh, greater leverage of tier two, three locations, small scale centers, diversifying to more number of countries, uh, smaller centers, and then also to some extent, increasing the number of hubs. Net net, we believe that the past few months, they have given organizations an opportunity to rethink their entire service delivery model, uh, look for newer ways to drive cost improvement, mitigate risk, and this will, this will be a key element for future locations and service delivery model. Yeah, I think that's the, the, key, the key there, that Rishi, is that this is, indicating that folks are looking at bi-directional, they're looking at more or less, how do I change that risk profile for my organization? Uh, and, and basically it goes back to the original comment I made at the very beginning, which is everything's on the table and uh, never let it, you know, never let that uh, opportunity go past in terms of reevaluating what has been true in the past and what needs to be true going forward. Absolutely, absolutely, Michael. So with that, we would, would we, I would pass it on to Anurag uh, to help us explain what would be the potential impact of this on workplace and locations model. Yeah. So on this page, we've tried to define a few, uh, you know, existing as well as new workplace models, right? Um, so as you move towards the right on the page, the mo the delivery models are becoming less centralized, uh, you know, smaller in size, also. Uh, more complex to manage, uh, and that has an implication on what we are saying next. Uh, but first, on the on 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 this you know delivery model, so hub and spoke are pretty well known, right? Uh, these are common models of delivery 
uh, hubs are large scale, multifunctional functional spokes are small to medium scale. Maybe they are delivering one to function, one or two functions, complementing hubs for you know either need skills or languages or time zone, etc. Uh, the new roles that they, they are actually playing are or may play potentially are the hubs may become drivers of firm culture. So this is where the firm culture is formed, is propagated. In in that in that sense, they may be plug-in points for remote employees uh, along with spoke as well, uh, where you know people working in satellites or pods or working from home are actually uh, visiting spokes or hubs, you know, for some of their time. Uh, but really, the focus will be on enhancing uh, or actually ramping up uh, the satellite pods or work from home. Uh, pods or satellites are the way we are defining this is these are small scale or even subscale uh, delivery models uh, could be shared workspace flexible workspace uh, they enhance access to scarce talent so you set these up in an area where you were, you would not think of setting up an office earlier because of scale reasons uh, but they aid in your bcp goals uh, in many organizations we are seeing this is being talked about as a you know evp enhancer so people can cycle to work or walk to these centers they're near their homes uh, and again uh, on the work from home side uh, i think this is everyone has experienced this so uh, you know these are aid in bcp goals but also enhance evp uh, on the satellite pods and work from home uh, the one point i wanted to make also was that these are potentially better suited for a contingent or a gig or a crowd model given that in that case then you're not so worried about whether i'm able to um, you know percolate or disseminate my firm culture to these these kinds of working models to, to some extent you will need to even in that model but you don't have to be really worried about whether these these um, employees feel part of the firm uh, if you if you go to the next page we'll see that um, you know how these will interplay so while there'll be global regional headquarters uh, you know that will be serviced by hubs uh, and potentially even directly by spokes. Uh, many of these satellites and work from home models will actually be mapped to uh, mapped to spokes in turn. Uh, and so uh, this basically needs means that uh, there is going to be a fairly complicated service delivery uh, ecosystem out there uh, in the future. And what it means is then that we will need or firms will need uh, design principles and discipline to actually follow those design principles. Uh, and that is what we're trying to define on the next page, uh, which is where we are saying that um, uh, design principles need to be intentional, but also iterative. And let's come to the iterative bit in a while, but first understand what does design mean? So at the base of it, you start with mapping your demand segments uh, and then forecasting your demand. This can be uh, you know, things like sourcing mix, ensuring mix, how demand breaks by each of these. Uh, but also by individual, uh, you know, business units or geographies uh, or functions, uh, and then you layer the impact of things like automation, pyramid optimization, so to understand your demand, how it pans in the next three to five years. Right. Uh, the second is you then look at your supply ecosystem. Uh, so you consider some delivery locations constructs, you know, using your known gaps and issues. Uh, and then forecast your talent availability across this and you compare these for things like ability to give you talent access, your cost of delivery, proximity to clients, uh, ability to enhance BCP, et cetera. But then what you do is then nail down your design of the delivery portfolio, right? So what does that mean? So first of all, you look at the number of centers you need per demand segment. Some larger segments may need uh, two hubs to support them. Some may need just one hub or one spoke. Some may actually just need one spoke, right? So you freeze on the number of centers you need per demand segment. Then you look at what are the roles you want locations to play. Uh, so, you know, do you need one hub? Do you need one spoke? Do you need a satellite actually? Or do you need someone working in a pod? So that then defines what kind of cities will fit those requirements. And then you free, freeze the cities that you that are in your portfolio. And ultimately, a combination of all of these three will actually then give you uh, the design elements around what is the optimum size or scale for each center and what is the work mix you're allocating to its center. So this is what we're calling design principles. Uh, and the important thing to keep in mind is this is not a one and done. Uh, this is a lather, rinse, repeat kind of an exercise where you keep iterating this based on changes in demand or supply environment. So every time there's a new demand center that opens up, you actually go back to design principles and run this process or update the process and then come back to your, you know, how does that change my design? But then in the interim, you stick with that design. 
with that i'll i'll uh, pass it on to um, uh, my colleagues the only uh, final comment is uh, that i'll have what she's having in because of this uh, design principles which have to be contextualized for each company the i'll have what she's having kind of an approach will not work yeah, so let's look at this in the context of, of locations. And so uh, we always like to show off our, our, our data and show off our ability to deliver great work for you. So we're gonna offer up a complimentary uh, location analysis here. So think about this in the future of risk. Many organizations are looking to de-risk their location strategy. And so they're looking at or exploring up and coming cities. And so what we're, we're doing today is it, uh, we're, we're gonna bring up a, a quick poll here in a second, but we're going to give you the opportunity to sample some of these up and coming locations. And we've got a list of 20 to choose from. And we're going to allow you to compare those to very popular baseline locations for two different functions or up to two different functions. You can choose which one you want, either IT or finance and accounting. And what we're going to give you back on that is going to be our comparison between the up and coming and the baseline for their financial attractiveness and operating and business risk, uh, a little bit about the, the entry level talent pool and some market landscape. Uh, information. So, um, if we can bring up the quick poll, if you're interested in doing this, it'll be customized for uh, for yourselves. And if you, uh, I think we're also going to put a uh, a link to this uh, in the chat room that you can see, and you can click that link there as well. So either way, you can get there. Uh, let us know if you're interested, and we'll be happy to um, and provide this back to you uh, in in very short order. So. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the next set of convictions. And uh, uh, Harisha, you're going to take this on and uh, start start us again. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. So our next conviction is uh, work from home is going to stay even in a post-COVID world, uh, given organizations have gained greater comfort with the model, and it will coexist with the work from office model that we have. Uh, the, and why we think so, uh, so as we uh, given work from home has multiple benefits. Can we move to the next page? Yeah, so given multiple benefits which work from home has, uh, as we speak to our clients, uh, they have not only pointed on the cost savings part of work from home, but also other benefits like access to a diverse, ability to access a diverse talent pool, uh, and enhancing BCP and some other indirect benefits like societal uh, and environmental benefits, uh, reduced traffic, uh, reduced pollution levels, and also in, in enhancement of employee value proposition at an overall level. Having said that, uh, it's, uh, our clients are also concerned about some of the challenges uh, which this might pose. So with the most prominent one being uh, driving company culture, uh, things around data security, and also there is a concern around burnout in a work, work from home model. Uh, with that, we move to our next provocation, uh, which is work from home in a post COVID-19 world would not be an extension of work from home uh, during COVID-19. So there, there will be uh, lots of difference in the way we are working from home now uh, and what we what it would be in under normal circumstances. Uh, and thus, uh, thus what work from home decisions would need to be tailored for each function, process, team, and probably at an employer work, uh, as in which functions uh, will work from home or which teams will work from home. Also, the choice of locations for work from home uh, will require different consideration than traditional philosophies uh, we have for uh, service delivery center. Uh, so with that, uh, we, as we move, uh, we looked at how, how the work from home penetration has trended across organizations before, during the COVID. Uh, so obviously before the pandemic, uh, there was very limited adoption of work from home. Only fewer companies had this as a predominant delivery model, less than 10. Uh, during, the, uh, during the COVID-19, obviously we had a significant upsurge, more than 75%, and given this was not a choice, but a necessity to keep the operations running. 
However, we believe that as things move back to normal, uh, the level of work from home penetration would decline that world than what we have currently. Uh, while it will not move back to the pre-COVID phase, uh, given the given the rising comfort level and the potential benefits we have seen, but it will move to somewhat around the 50% adoption. With that, I pass on to Anurag to walk us through how to go about the work from home strategy. Yeah, thanks Rishi. So we've published a few papers on this. Uh, essentially what we're saying is that this has to be a fact-based and intentional exercise. Uh, so you start with looking at work types that are most suitable for remote working. So on the on the right hand side, you can see some uh, what we've done is look at looked at some two by twos around ac acceptance of risk of working from home versus ease of remote delivery. So use that to divide work into segments of you know zone of acceptance, zone of reluctant act acceptance, zone of resistance, and zone of rejection based on how easy is it or uh, how ex how uh, you can accept the risk around this. Um, use that and then come up with by process, by team, what is the extent of work from home you can actually drive. But then also number three, you have to you have to be sensitive to consider employee choices because this is going to be part of your value proposition to employees. Uh, and so you have to take into account whether they actually want that flexibility or want to be fully work from home versus fully office based. And that all of that helps you um, assess the size of your work from home teams and then in by implication what is the real estate implication from working from home on the next page what we are saying is like rishi said the considerations for location selection or even let's say optimization of portfolio will be different in the new environment given that you will have to keep in mind whether locations are conducive to a work from home kind of a setup so there are multiple factors we looked at uh, we are looking we, we believe will come into play so things like infrastructure around the broadband penetration, broadband quality, cost of broadband, uh, the regulations and restrictions from government around this, uh, the ecosystem for work from home adoption. So these are things like, you know, uh, social acceptance of working from home. So, you know, what are family sizes? Uh, you know, are there uh, reading or work rooms that people can use as offices? Are there, are there uh, what are the noise levels in the society, right? Uh, plus the safety security aspects like, um, you know, because people are working from home, they're exposed to many more risks uh, in from a health and safety point of view uh, or a natural disaster point of view. Uh, and then all the benefits that uh, Rishi pointed to earlier. But then what we did on the next page actually was looked at some of these parameters and simulated this attractiveness for a few geographies. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind is that we did this at a country level but at a city level the ratings may actually differ uh, even within countries but at a very high level what you will see on this page is that some of the benefits around you know adding to bcp or societal benefits are actually higher in the large offshore geography like india and the philippines uh, whereas things like savings uh, cost savings or safety security infrastructure regulatory uh, environment as well as ecosystem for work from home are actually better off in the nearshore and onshore markets. So net net, I think what will happen is that um, the large scale full orientation towards work from home uh, will actually we'll see more of that in onshore and nearshore markets, whereas the offshore markets may see more selective based on work types that work and maybe partial work from home where companies allow people to work from home, let's say some days of the week. Uh, with that, I'll pass it over uh, to Michael to take us through our last conviction and provocations. All right. So the, the, the thing that we want to make sure we're leaving you with is while the location and delivery portfolios are extremely important, uh, they're not to be considered in isolation. So as I've said several times, all options are on the table as we, we think about this moving forward here. So um, from my perspective and have looked at this for, for uh, many different uh, decades, uh, don't let a crisis go to waste. Uh, take advantage of this to to really think about uh, what the uh, opportunities are out there. Um, if we look at some of the things that uh, you know how how to think about this in a, in a holistic approach, uh, certainly COVID um, has been a compelling event. It's allowed us to challenge that con that conventional wisdom. It's allowed us to rethink uh, the opportunities. Some of us have already blown our budgets in terms of hey, we're not going to make our our uh, our profitability. So let's use this to get 2020 uh, ready, for, uh, get ready for 2021 and, and beyond, and let's fix that. 
Um, things like automation, you know, it says here automation's not really worked. I, I'd say automation is a key and we have to figure out how to make it work, okay? And it, it, it's not just about uh, automation for itself, but it's understanding how it impacts the work level. Um, the other thing we, we wanna uh, be careful of is to assume that uh, uh, work from home, that's, again, that's the compelling event, but it's not the end game. Uh, so when we start talking about future work, that's really what we're starting talking about this in a comprehensive uh, uh, basis. Um, and so, you know, just thinking about this as a, as a holistic conversation, and I'll bring us back to the, to the original slide I started out with. Um, you know, you, you, you can't, I can't stress enough the, the ability to take, take advantage of the opportunity here. Uh, we didn't cover some of the things that we, we would uh, normally talk about in terms of talent model and technology, but those are important parts of the conversation as well. And so we urge you to kind of step back, you know, rethink how the workers uh, uh, approaching this. And, and again, you know, when we start talking about the talent specifically, one of the things we would talk about is you can't, you know, not only has the work world changed, but so has the home world changed, you know, and that's an important part of not only you know, what's happening in the, at a social level and a family level, um, but also at an individual level, what's their, their intent and goals in life? Have those changed and do, how do they want to approach work? So that can't be ignored. So it's easy to get focused in on economics and locations, but there's people involved in this too. And so people are going to want to think about this in a very different way. Maybe work from home has, has allowed them to, to, to rethink their life's priorities. So anyway, uh, let's, let's end this with our uh, list of controversies. These are things that uh, we want to consider as we go forward here in our future research and uh, and urge you to, to, uh, to dialogue with us on these as well. Okay, I'll just take a minute to walk through this. So, so the first one is really obvious where we're saying, you know, as companies diversify and, you know, there are advances in collaboration technology and comfort with working from home and remote delivery, does that still mean large scale delivery hubs will exist? So that's a big question. Uh, the second one is quite interesting to me. This one says, you know, how does remote delivery actually have longer term changes on socioeconomics and, you know, talent models, right? So does it mean that some of the remote delivery will be more uh, leveraged for contingent talent? Uh, so that's one question. Second, I think is, um, you know, will we see some cities emerging as talent hubs, not because that is where most businesses are congregated, but more because there are, you know, it's a friendly, uh, friendly income taxes, good quality of life, health care, cost of living is low, right? So will companies need to redo their talent models because of this, right? Third is in the remote delivery model, will that lead to more inclusiveness or diversity? So will growth, you know, in terms of satellites or pods or even work from home spread to less privileged, less developed areas within countries? Will that lead to more impact sourcing, veterans or women coming back to work? Uh, will the workplace become more democratic, given that online personas are less, uh, you know, susceptible to um, prejudices and discrimination? So some of these are interesting. And finally, I think while we've seen governments changing regulations in the interim to support the work from home orientation, will that really continue as we get into the next normal or post vaccine, post COVID environment? So that's where that's where we leave you with some of these thoughts as to you know ponder over what is the next. Uh, these, that's why we're saying these are controversies for what needs to be watched out for. Over to All you, Michael. Right. All right, great. So uh, as we wrap up, we left, have left uh, a few minutes for questions, and I wanted to uh, pick a few of them. There's, there's several pages of questions here. So let me just pick on a couple here to ask. And um, here's an easy one. Does this mean that Eastern Europe is, uh, is emerging as the new offshore location of choice? Uh, I can I can take that, Michael. So um, in many ways, Eastern Europe has been a favorite nearshore destination for Europe, right? Um, and I, I guess that's that's the spirit of the question. Uh, for the past five or seven years, we've seen rapid growth and acceleration in the in that region, uh, to the extent that in many um, you know cycles, it has actually uh, outpaced Asia Pacific. If you ignore India for a while. It has outpaced uh, rest of Asia Pacific in terms of growth, right? So that is likely to continue to happen. The, if the question is, will there be acceleration in that trend? We believe yes, there will be acceleration as companies uh, diversify and want to put more capacity near to themselves, which is which was anyway an implication and a trend before COVID-19. We see that trend will accelerate post-COVID-19. So Anurag, I, I've I've looked at this uh, for almost 
20 years now and mm -hmm. and the only thing i worry about eastern europe is the is the the availability of of the talent pool and you know i always look back to india in terms of scale and uh, the ability for India to continue to graduate humongous uh, new classes of 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 of, uh, of talent every year. Uh, do we believe that uh, Eastern Europe will have the, the talent capacity? That that's a fair question, Michael. And I think I think like we like we were saying earlier, right? There are two elements to this. One is if you looked at the survey results, there are companies that are saying we won't grow more offshore because we are already too big or there's too much delivery risk or we are not able to find the right talent right so that's one angle the second is that if you go back to design principles right and that's what we've been saying you there may be there are enterprises that need nearshore capacity because they want to drive something that is the, where they need cultural affinity where they need same time zone proximate delivery ability to travel which obviously in the short term will be affected but there is a there is a niche and a place for each kind of shore of delivery and so there is a fairly big role for nearshore delivery. And that's why we've seen while the numbers are not the same in or as in offshore markets, from a quality of talent and a ability to learn niche skills or support in a more intimate manner, uh, these are the reasons why we've seen so much growth in nearshore and we'll continue to see that growth. Okay. Another question here, what has been the top alternative for the Philippines? For Rishi, do you that? Yeah, what has been the top alternative for the Philippines? So uh, under current circumstances, what we have seen due to the uh, increasing risk and given the Philippines being largely a contact center market with voice being an important co component, uh, even work from home delivery for those kind of services becomes difficult uh, from Asian geographies. And thus, uh, there's a growing tendency to move that work either near shore or onshore, which would mean basically moving back to the US uh, or Europe or to some of the Latin American regions. Yeah, I think I think the only point I'd add there, Michael, is that um, I think the question is not what is the alternative to Philippines. Maybe in some cases it is, but I guess the other question also is are there locations that go complementarily with it, right? So maybe you retain your Philippines because it gives you the low cost, you know, high scale kind of delivery. But then maybe you add a, and this, this is where I talk about alternatives. So you add a South Africa if you want to support the UK market, let's say, or you add an Eastern Europe because you want to support Western Europe, or you add an add a an Guatemala or a Costa Rica, uh, you know, or a Colombia because you want to support the US or America's market. So there are there are alternatives. There is none that will fit the exact profile of the Philippines, and so I say it is not replaceable in in true in in the true sense. But there are there are uh, locations that may help you diversify your presence in the Philippines. Yeah, and I look at it structurally. You know, again, people when we looked at the, some of the data recently, uh, people were still moving more, more work incrementally, and just a few centers were moving away. But I think that'll just put pressure on companies to up their game in terms of uh, the ability, uh, the infrastructure. You know, so maybe some up in the game with the infrastructure, uh, even from a governmental standpoint, to support the industry. I don't think it's going to go away. I don't think the, you know, the call the end of the Philippines for, from, a, a, from an overall BPO. I don't think that that's going to happen at all. I, I remember we had some of these similar type conversations with India back in mm -hmm. 2003, 2004, you know, when their infrastructure was was challenged uh, more so than it is today. So I, yeah, don't, I, I don't call the end yeah, of it. In the same anal analogy, right? I mean, uh, we've seen India growing, you know, strength to strength in the past five to 10 years. Uh, and the reason has been that it is not that companies are looking at replacing India, but they're really saying, okay, maybe I'm too big in India. So how do I diversify some of that and grow more scale near shot? Yeah. Uh, right, another... even on... Go ahead. Yeah, even within Philippines, we see there is a tendency to move beyond Metro Manila and uh, mm -hmm. the digital cities initiatives that we see the government has launched. Uh, it might prove some benefits with some of the tier two, three cities, uh, which have been yesterday impacted by the pandemic may see growth. So that can be another alternative. Yeah. All right, we'll do one more question here. And this is really what I, I was actually referring to earlier about, you know, this comes does come down to people and uh, we can never forget that. It's easy to look at those locations, but it's really easy. It's, you can't forget the people. So how does the gig economy change the talent build, ability view? 
So, so Michael, if you look at the overall, um, so I, I think, like I, like I said earlier in the in one of the slides, right? Uh, some of the uh, satellite pod work from home model may be better suited for a gig kind of a model. Again, where it works, obviously, from a skills perspective, one it offers you a you know large talent pool that let's say is not getting tapped right now, or maybe will never get get tapped in the conventional work from office, large scale hub kind of a setup because these people may be, they don't want to live in the large cities or they don't want to work full time, right? Uh, and so it enhances access for you, um, especially for niche skills where you're struggling for talent. Uh, obviously there are challenges to this as well. So multiple challenges around data security, you know, cultural um, alignment, uh, as well as uh, how do you deal with regulations, right? So if you have a gig em gig employee uh, in a different part of the part of the country or a different part of the continent, then do you have to set up an entity to actually you know uh, hire that person? Um, so there are multiple considerations and factors that will go into how easy is it for you to integrate. But from a talent point of view, the gig market definitely adds a adds a um, layer over your current access. Yeah, and I, and I want to go back and remind people, you know, the, the demographic, the structural things that were in play where talent was, we, we were talking about talent shortages for the last many years, you know, uh, yes, we've had a economic disruption that's caused more people to be unemployed. Um, but I, I, I think the people that we're talking about for this pool of labor are, are, are going to be in short supply again. And I think that's, you know, we're going to have to think about, you know, how work gets done and, and how and people and individual employees are going to think about how they want to do work. And so I think work from home uh, has been the catalyst for many, many other considerations. You know, I, I, I personally, you know, I think people are enjoying not having to make the one hour commute to work and the one hour commute away from work. And I think they're going to look at it and say, hey, my life is better by not having to make that commute. And if I have options, I'm going to take those options. So anyway, let's leave it there. Um, and I uh, want to thank uh, Anurag and, and Rishi for, for their, their participation and, uh, of course, all, all of you. There are many, many more questions we were not able to get to. We have a list of those, and we will um, go ahead and try to address those on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, I also wanted to point out that we have other research resources available online. Uh, so we have a number of logs. A blogs here that you can look at. Of course, all our, our research, core research content is available too uh, for our members. And then finally, uh, yeah, here's a list of, of, of some of the core research content. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, the locations analysis that we talked about, some of the up and coming, uh, as you're thinking about uh, new new places that might be interesting to, to explore, uh, we offer that uh, that a bit to you and i think that'll actually come up pop up in your your after uh, conference survey to 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 take advantage of that if you're interested so thank you for your time today appreciate it